Hey folks, Scott Bradley here, and welcome to Torbus University. Each episode has two parts, the free part that you're hearing now, and a subscriber-only bonus part that you can access by subscribing to the Torbus University Patreon. This is the very first episode, and my guest is Morgan James, a Broadway star and recording artist that has also collaborated with me on quite a few postmodern jukebox tracks. I love talking to Morgan because she's refreshingly down-to-earth and doesn't mince words when it comes to talking about the music industry. It makes sense that the main theme that emerged in our conversation was the importance of authenticity when it comes to building a career as an artist. Morgan has always stayed true to her vision as an artist, even when faced with rejection. And when you listen to her speak, it's clear that this has afforded her a type of creative freedom that most artists, even very successful ones, never achieve. I think that anyone that has struggled with the idea of retrofitting their art to be more trendy or current will find comfort in the fact that there is another way and Morgan is actively out there doing it. So let's get into it. Please welcome Morgan James. All right, so I'm here with Morgan James. Uh, Morgan James, congratulations on being the first guest ever. Thank you so much. I know that's good. I'm very honored. You could ask so many, so many people, so many luminaries have so come many, through your so doors. So many, so many way more famous people. But uh, it's way more famous. People. <laughs> that's not true yeah, at all. Yeah, but puddles, puddles and Haley were not available, so I'll gladly accept third, <laughs> third place. Well, um, you know, there was a reason that I picked you for the first guest, and you oh, know, okay. well, the whole point of this thing was I want to kind of create this resource for independent artists. You know, people that are doing, you know, a career in music or any kind of creative arts on their own terms. And you're a perfect example of that. You know, I got to be there at a front row seat and watch you kind of develop as an artist and get to the point where you're touring on your own, you're releasing lots of albums. And, um, you know, it's been, I think, really inspiring. Your story is really great, you know, for anybody that is super talented but can't figure out how to put all the pieces together because they feel like they don't fit in any box. Well, thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, you know, you and I met when I was still at Epic Records, and I was kind of trying to navigate that whole <laughs> thing, um, the major label kind of thing, and try to find how how to make a career. Yeah, through, well, I want to get into that. I want to get into your like your early, you know, uh, experiments with music, like your first things. You know, um, I want to totally. I want to get into your Broadway career and all that stuff. But first, I want to talk about Peggy because. That oh, is first. The, wow. I mean, that is She's the most She's never been thing. first on anyone's yeah. list, but I love it. <laughs> well, okay. So she has a new episode every Thursday, by the way. So Peggy has a podcast now. Pe Peggy has a podcast wow. now. Peggy had a podcast before Scott Bradley had a podcast. <laughs> so let that sink in. Let that sink in for a moment. Um, so for those at home, uh, Peggy was this creation that Morgan had. And I remember I was on tour with Morgan and she was telling us about this. She had a secret Instagram page where she would dress up and she would film all this content. And it seemed to me at the time that she was putting more effort into that than probably her own career. I don't know if that's a true yeah. statement. 100%. Yeah. Yes. So ex explain who Peggy is. <laughs> So if you want to find Peggy, she's on Instagram, greetings, it's Peggy, and she has a, her own podcast now called Getting Peggy With It on the Broadway Podcast Network or anywhere you find podcasts. And it started as uh, when I was in Motown, the musical on, on Broadway, and I, even though Motown for me on Broadway was one of the most influential shows that I did because of the incredible people I met, it was probably the least amount of creative activity I had to do in any show I'd ever done because I was like the white person. So, and there were, you know, if you look back through history, not many white artists on Motown. So I was, <laughs> you know, I didn't have much to do, but I had some really cute costumes, including the one that you see, if you see Peggy and backstage, I would create whole worlds and scenes and monologues. And I would be ridiculous and try to make people laugh backstage. And it started to be a, a popular thing with the cast where people wanted me to, you know, roast them or, you know, mess with them. And, and I had so much fun being this other, using my improvisational skills that, and my kind of my love for comedy. So when the show, when I left the show to pursue a solo career and go start touring full time and making records, I really had this sadness, not even for missing Broadway, but for missing this weird character <laughs> and for missing the joy and the fun that I would create backstage with my friends. So I got a little depressed, and so I looked, and I, I ordered a wig and a costume, and I started dressing up by myself and recording myself all around Harlem do, with just talking to people, like man-on-the-street style. 
And that's how it kind of got going. And a few of my um, other like kind of Broadway friends started to really like her and say, you know, Peggy's my favorite thing. And and she did a PMJ search video. That was amazing. Um, that was epic. She's just it just makes me laugh. It's like my hobby. It's like some people crochet and I go on the street and, and just be a weirdo and harass sure. people. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. Well, I, I encourage everybody to follow. Um, I want to hear the podcast. That sounds that sounds pretty ridiculous. Yeah, you know, the podcast format, it's a little hard when you don't see her ridiculous facial expressions and her. We're adding a video component. Okay, that's going to be a game Luther. changer. That's going to be something yes. else. And the, the format is that she basically gets, she sits down with a Broadway luminary and roasts them. And they're all such good sports. And, it's, and then she has a little game she plays, like one's called Actors Are Dumb, and she asks them trivia. Yeah. And one, <laughs> just, just so it's kind of like a triumph, rude. the insult comic dog kind of exactly vibe to exactly it. that's good it's like I mean, a jiminy glick vibe that's great that's so cool um yeah well uh, yeah i definitely want to see that but let's go back we'll, we'll go back and we'll get before peggy you know and now you, right. you really yeah. broke on broadway i guess um or or do you think of it in a different way do you think of yourself as broadway first or do you think of yourself yeah i definitely think that mm. i that i made you know made it i don't know about made it on broadway made it there got there made it on broadway i guess i can say and kind of knocked through that door before I kind of even knew that I wanted to be a solo artist. Really? Uh, yeah. You know, because that was one of my oldest dreams. I wanted to mm -hmm. be on Broadway since I was, you know, probably in junior high when I started singing. Okay. Uh -huh. it, and, you know, I, I wanted to go to Juilliard because Audra McDonald had gone to Juilliard and because mm -hmm. Patti Lapone had gone to Juilliard. And so for some reason I thought, okay, Juilliard is my ticket to New York City. Of course, if, I, if I'd known that there were lots of other cheaper and easier tickets to New York City, <laughs> Perhaps would have taken them, but I, for in my mind, I was like, it has to be Juilliard. I have to go there. I have to see what these people saw and do these things. And I wanted to be on Broadway. So when I graduated from Juilliard, that's kind of what I, what I pursued full time. Now that's kind of funny to me because you know when I think when most people listen to your voice, you don't sound like a typical Broadway singer. If there's like a you know a typical thing that you think of when you think of Broadway, you know, you sound like an R and B singer. You sound like somebody that you know you have this really powerful voice that has a lot of soul qualities to it. Was that something that you were developing at that same time? Were you finding your sound? Broadway, you're supposed to play a character. You're supposed to sound, mm -hmm. um, it, it, there's kind of a limit of how much you can put, you know, on any Broadway role, right? Like you can only. Absolutely. You know, yeah. So yeah, there's only so much of yourself you can bring to it. It's really, it's a, a very, I love the tradition of musical theater and I love this, the various styles that it implements. Right. Um, but it's not really for showing your individuality. Right, yeah. I mean, how did you develop your own sound? Because I think that your sound is, it's, it's so unique. And, you know, I think that for a lot of people that haven't, seen, that haven't heard you sing Broadway, they probably have a hard time picturing you in a Broadway yeah. show, you know? Yeah, you know, I, when I was at Juilliard, I was a soprano. So I wanted to be like the next Barbara Cook or um, Maren Maisie, Judy Kuhn, uh, Rebecca Luker. Like these were my idols, right? Gotcha. Audra McDonald. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I, when I graduated, I I thought that it would be very easy to get jobs <laughs> because that I was naive. And I thought, well, if you work hard and you have a degree from Juilliard, it's just a matter. It's a matter of time. Mm -hmm. And it was a matter of time, 10 years, you know, <laughs> that, that it took me. But I, I developed my sound. It's, it, I always, I mean, it's necessity is the mother of invention. So I developed a different sound because I was not booking work with the sound I had. Wow. And I, it came out of a lot of sadness and a lot of rejection. And, and, a, and I didn't know if I was ever going to be accepted into this Broadway community. It just, it was very, very sad and very hard for me to, you know, I would get a few things here and there. It's not that I was never working, but I would get a job and then maybe six, eight months with nothing. And then I would be waiting tables and catering. And then I mm. maybe get a job and very slow kind of progression. I wasn't like really breaking into that world. And also that voice type, that soprano, traditional musical theater style voice mm. was really not popular anymore at that moment. Right. All that was popular was like wicked rent, like rock shows. It was a belt and kind of, yeah. Yeah. Mm. And I didn't know how to do that. Mm. And so I taught myself to belt some, a few years after I graduated, but I definitely didn't have my own solo kind of voice. I loved that music. I and mean, I've always had a really diverse kind of love of music, mm -hmm. 
But it wasn't until I didn't have the wherewithal or the time or the money to start a band or to start experimenting until I got my first Broadway show. Mm. You you know you know how it is when you're not working. You don't really have like a lot of time and money to like no, to no. spend on extracurricular things. Well, I mean, I I've always kind of recommended the people, the, you know, people that are you know in that position, which I think most artists are at at a certain time. Like I definitely was in the position where I wasn't I wasn't booking any gigs at all, you know. But I had these ideas and everything. But it's like you can't do those ideas until you take care of, you know, you got to bring in an income somehow. And it's tough because sometimes it does leave you with very little free time. But then you have to be very you have to guard your time so cautiously, you know. And yeah. I think mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like that's what you did. So you just taught yourself to belt. Like go back to that because I think that that's. For, for most people, well, probably don't even, you know, that well, sounds you, really you difficult. Couldn't, I mean, you know? it wasn't, it wasn't, it was before the time where you could get a coaching or a lesson online. There's that. Mm -hmm. You couldn't watch every single video of, of everyone that's ever sung. You know, YouTube was kind of just a brand, brand new thing. Just cat videos. But I just, yeah. just like one cat video, the original. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, I taught myself to belt by listening to and then watching Pavarotti. Wow. And I would, and, and I would listen to some women that I thought had healthy sounding belt voices, mm -hmm. but you know, I took a few lessons after Juilliard and I was really nervous because from the classical world, you're not supposed to experiment. You're yeah. not supposed to do with your instrument what I do with now. Right. Uh, or at least that's what you're taught. You're taught to just stay in your lane. And so I was kind of like secretly trying to teach myself to do, to really stretch my voice into totally different ways and directions. And I think Pavarotti is an incredible belter, and so that's that was the basis of my self technique. In Mahalia Jackson, it was the same thing. She was inspired by Caruso, so you yeah, had these big absolutely. female vocalists that were inspired by, I guess, tenor vocalists, which was kind of yeah, crazy. Yeah, and what the tenor is really trying to do is what we try to do by taking the, you know, for lack of a more complex way of speaking about it, taking the chest voice higher and higher, yeah. right? And that's what mm -hmm. a tenor does. A mm -hmm. tenor takes, it's thrilling because they take, they do something with it that it, they're not supposed to be able to do, right? right. They, they they bring the chest resonance all the way up until their head. At least that's what we hear. Yeah, yeah. And it's so thrilling because it could break. Like that's what's kind of cool about it is that it sounds like it's on the edge. Living on the edge. Living on yeah. the edge, you know, and that's what great rock, sing rock singers do, like Steve Perry and absolutely, yeah, and and Robert Plant and all these people and Freddie Mercury and rock singers that I really, really admire. Mm. I try to emulate them as well. Yeah, was there a turning point? Was there a certain like? Was there a time where you're like, I'm really getting this? Like that you could kind of point to? I was starting to, uh, you know, I worked at a restaurant called Prohibition that has live music every night. Okay, and I was I waited tables and bartended there. And they had bands every single night. And I would like finally after several months, one time I was like, well, do you think I could sing a song? And they're like, and I was like bun in my hair, very, very t like buttoned up, not fun. <laughs> and, um, and they were like, oh God, the soprano is going to sing at the, with the band. This is going to be the worst thing ever. And so I, I sang, started testing out my belt voice there. Really? And so I, I yeah, yeah. And, and everybody was so supportive. And that's how I got into club dates and wedding dates and wedding bands and stuff. And they were like, Hey, I learned these 200 songs, you know? Yeah, yeah, so I yeah. started doing that on the weekends and how old and were I you started... when, when this all happened just for context? Well, this was after college. So 23, 24, 25, okay. 26, uh -huh. 27. Wow. Okay. So that seems yeah. like that's probably late to really put together your voice, isn't it? I mean, Oh yeah. 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 However, I think that it's probably good that I was, that I learned to do this later when my voice was more mature, because yeah. I think sometimes girls can hurt it if they try to do advanced things when they're too young. Mm. At, who, I mean, we'll never know, but it, it, I came about it in a really healthy way because I had already had all this training. Right. Yeah. And you have so an understanding was, of the voice too, you know, where yeah. I think probably yeah. somebody that came to it that was like a natural for lack of a better term you know that already had those things in place they probably can't uh -huh. articulate what they're doing but yeah you know it seems true. like it's even true. your description of that like you you under you knew what you were looking for the sound and then you were just kind of just putting the pieces together to figure out how to achieve that well and at the time i thought i was only get, gonna have to do it just as i'll just do this while it's popular and then i'll be able to become a star as a soprano someday oh yeah uh -huh. i i never thought it was gonna be my life yeah Really? Wow. I was like, okay, I just, I just need to be able to get jobs. And in order to get jobs, I got to look a certain way and sound a certain way. And in the process, I really, I kind of really found my true calling. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, your sound is so identifiable now. Well, thank you. That's, that's a compliment. Thank you. 
I, I hope so. You know, at the beginning, when you first learn, you're just imitating. Yeah. You know? Everybody goes through that phase. And there's, everybody goes mm. through that. And there's nothing wrong with imitation. And it's especially when you're trying to imitate or emulate great, great artists. And uh, there's nothing wrong with it. But at a certain point, you have to break out, recognize where you come from, and develop a piece of it that's really your own you know that's always the goal yeah okay so let's let's actually let's jump now let's jump to um when i met you you were on Epic records right you had a major label deal yep yeah and, I um, had, when we met i had kind of maybe been signed with them for a, a year or so no maybe two years with epic records right yeah. and that sounds like to, i mean to most people that's the dream right and i'm probably at the time when you got yeah. signed that was the dream right like to be on absolutely a major label that was absolutely like, that's crazy. the dream yeah and i remember even when that email came in it's like we got the singer from epic records i'm like whoa it's like a singer from like a a real record label like this is crazy you know so yeah <laughs> well you know it's i it was the dream, and um, I'm very, very glad I had the experience on a major label f uh, for many reasons. Yeah. I learned how to make a record, and but the main reason I'm glad I was signed and had that experience is because it taught me that there is no magic bullet. Mm. It, it taught me that having a major label deal is not going to um, pave the way for you and solve the problems, and it's not going to help you become an artist. Yeah. I, you know, it's going to help you in some other way. It helped me, you know, I learned how to make a, a music video and made, how to make an album and how to do a photo shoot. And I got, and I had a lot of money thrown my way. And I miss that because obviously who doesn't want that when they're trying to make a project. But outside of that, everything else I had to find after the fact. Right. Yeah. That's an interesting way to look at it because I guess it does teach you, it teaches you all the steps that you need to release something. I mean, labels are good at what they do. Yeah. Like they know They're how to make money on do. music. And, um, yeah, absolutely. You know, but the thing is like nowadays you can take all those tools, you can do those things on your own and you can, you know, I mean, I, I, I think that I, while I was there, you know, a lot of the labels are, are floundering, you know, and they do things in an old school way. They don't move very quickly with the times and from what I saw yeah. at the label. Mm -hmm. And they want to do things the way things were done in the 90s, really, yeah, you know, yeah. and, mm -hmm. um, and it's not, the not, you know, so there were things that I was constantly saying, I wonder why they're spending money on this. I wonder why they're doing this that way. And I had a lot of, I butted heads a lot at the, at the label. For one thing, I... I had a different A and R every week. People were fired weekly. Really? Oh yeah, and the, it's like stuff like that was crazy. And um, it, the minute they saw that I wasn't going to be a big pop star, they started losing interest and in, in pulling the money back. And I, I kind of started to see the writing on the wall. Mm. So and, well, well, let's uh, actually elaborate on that. Now, did they, when they signed you, did they have an idea of what kind of artist you were? Was it something well, like... Well, no, that was part of the problem yeah. is that I was... Well, not the problem, but it, I was signed as a singer. Right. I wasn't really signed. As, I didn't have any songs not yet. Not as a songwriter and I wasn't, or anything like that. I wasn't signed as a songwriter, mm -hmm. and I they didn't really even know what kind of record I wanted to make. Yeah. I told them that I... They knew I had a soul, soulful voice, and Ellie Reed and Doug Morris loved my voice. Mm -hmm. They signed it for that alone, which is great. Mm -hmm. But then it was like, well, what kind of record do you want... It, all these conversations were so muddy because everybody wants to having a creative voice, unless you're signed as cerebralis, like these are my songs, mm. sign me having a creative voice or wanting to do things when you're kind of a nobody is very difficult. It's like go, just going uphill. Yeah. Well, I think it, and I, I don't think yeah. it even happens as much anymore. I think now it doesn't, people that, it it's doesn't. like, you know, they got the cash me outside girl. She's got a record deal, you know, she's on an Atlantic or something like that. You know, it's like, it's somebody that's virally famous or that already has yeah. a following or something like that. And then, and I didn't have any of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a following at all. Like a few people knew me from the Broadway world, but they didn't know this other side wow. of me really. So they, they and signed I you in an 20. old school way, which was to basically find a great voice and then, but then, Develop but it, then that's where A and R comes in normally, you know. Yeah, the old way. If if you're not familiar with like the old way of, of you know record labels and record making, you know there used to be these A and R at records, um, artist and artist and repertoire, yeah. and they would go out and find bands and find songwriters and find songs, and they would be really developing artists. And it, I mean, it's how so many of the great acts that we love got found yep. and signed and all this stuff. But then through the years, it, it started to, the system started to break down. And by the time I got to the label, A&R were interns 
that sat at desks and they couldn't even tell me anything about me, much less what I wanted to sing or what. I mean, it was, wow. they're, they're gone. There may be some at other labels, but there are there were none at Epic Records, and nobody cared about what I was trying to make. Yeah. And I was also signed from the top down. So Mr. Gordy, Barry Gordy Jr., introduced me to Doug Morris. Doug Morris loved my voice, and Doug Morris signed me to Sony and handed me to L.A. Reid. Mm -hmm. So nobody at Epic was like, this is my artist. I can't. I, I will fight to the death to get her. Right. I loved my product manager, Scott Carter. Mm -hmm. He's one of the best in the business. And he's, there are, there are amazing people that work there. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. There are incredible people who, but the system is very, t so much red tape and so many ridiculous, um, preposterous things happened when I was there. Um, it was just, I, every time I came back from that 550 Madison Avenue where Sony used to be, I would be traumatized. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I was so afraid of getting dropped. And yet deep down I was like, maybe that will be a relief. And that it was my biggest fear. Mm. And yet I, the ch I felt like I was chained to that place and I couldn't do anything right. And one day I'd walk in and they'd say, oh, you should cut all your hair off and, and dye a platinum blonde. We'll make you a pop star. And I was just like, <laughs> Like, if you know me at all, you know, that's just like not me, yeah, you know, and uh, I think there are people that have incredible experiences and I, and I think that it can really work for people sometimes. Um, and I'm happy to hear that Sarah Bareilles and Fiona Apple are still at Epic and they're still letting them make incredible records. Right. They're, they're, they're helping them make incredible records. And I, so I, I think it's definitely possible. I think it um, depends probably on the context. Like, yeah, if you're coming in there as, you know, somebody that has that kind of track record of sales, you know, I think then maybe and hits. you're yeah. obviously going to be afforded more freedom, but, um, of course. but you know, it, it's so funny that even today there's so many artists that, I mean, that's their dream still, you know, and it's like, it's like being on television. Like that's a dream of people still. Yeah. I want to be on TV. All the TV shows are on YouTube or on Hulu or whatever, like Actual TV, I mean, I can't even remember the last time I watched, like, actual TV, like, on a television set. No, I can't either. But you know? but it's like we still hold on to it as if it's, like, a credibility thing, you know? I think it is. But, you know, if I, if I hadn't had that experience, I would still be one of those people going, well, all, you know, all I need is that record deal to make it. Mm. If I hadn't had the experience, for better or for worse, yeah. and all the good and bad that came from it, I would still be sitting, waiting for someone else to allow me to create. Mm, that's interesting. That's the biggest thing getting dropped did for me. Well, getting signed and then getting dropped. Yeah. That's the biggest thing it did for me was it said, you're going to survive. You're still going to be able to create art. You know, it's, it was a huge lesson for me. Yeah. So what was your mindset after getting dropped, like immediately after that happened? What was your mindset of how to go forward as an artist? Did you already have an idea of what you wanted to do and you were just like felt, you know, free to do it or... I didn't know. I knew what I wanted to make, but I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to get raise money and I didn't know how to ask for money. And I didn't know like, oh gosh, how do you assemble the full team? I mean, thankfully I have great management and, and, and a great agent. Yeah. And, but my manager is like having people that believe in you and say yes to your ideas, no matter how wacky they are. I mean, <laughs> and help you. I mean, it's just, I don't know how artists do it without a yeah, team of people. Totally. And so my managers were like, we're gonna, they just rallied behind me when I got dropped. And in fact, my manager, David flew out to New York to tell me the news because no one from Epic told me that I was dropped. Wow. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah. There, nobody even, nobody called me. I'd been there for years. Nobody, no. And he said to them on the phone, well, who's going to tell Morgan? They're like, and he said, he flew out to New York the next day. And I thought it was weird that we were going to have lunch, but, you know, I wanted to talk about the new record because they had just optioned my next record. That's the irony. Oh, wow. Okay. And so uh, we sat down and he said, he was really, really quiet. And he said, I've got good news and bad news. And I said, okay. And he goes, the good news is you're going to make any kind of record you want to make. <laughs> that's a good, I mean, that's a good setup. And that's how you would set that up. Yeah, it's, a, it's true. Yeah. And the bad news is <laughs> it's not going to be on Epic Records. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I remember saying like, I got dropped, like my biggest fear came true, you know? Mm -hmm. And he said, yes. Mm. And of course I immediately got sad yeah. and I got, I felt ashamed and, and I felt, yeah, sad. And he said, why are you, I started to cry. And he said, why are you crying? And I was like, I feel shame. And he was like, Morgan, 
everybody that you have ever admired has gone through this and this is a part of your story and this is going to be a part of your triumph and I'm not going anywhere and we got your back and it was, he's just they were awesome yeah. you know the people in my life mm -hmm. my you know Doug and everybody around me was like F them and we're gonna rally, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I know, I know Dave. And, yeah, yeah, David Britz, he's a great guy. And I, I didn't know what to do next, and you know, it took us, uh, you know, a couple of years to figure out what to do next. Mm -hmm. But I knew I wanted to build. Um, uh, well, David really wanted me to build a video uh, component content. Yeah. And uh, and then I wanted to tour, mm -hmm. and I thought that that's gonna be the way I'm gonna make my mark. I'm just gonna meet one person at a time in one city at a time, and I'm going to. I'm going to try to bring them onto my journey mm. with me. And I'm going to say, hey, I, rather than at the label where you're totally removed from fans, right? I wanted to say, no, you're come with me. Like, you're a part of my journey. I can't do this without you. Yeah. And the second I did that and I surrendered to the fact that the fans are so important and they can they want to be a part of your life mm. and your journey. And I don't know. I, I've really loved being an independent artist. And I think that it's so fun. And so um, there's so much freedom. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that for a certain person with, you know, a skill set, like the skill set you have, I think it's great because it it does allow you to be creative in a different sense, you know? I think that artists, sometimes they feel like they're not supposed to know anything about business or they're not supposed to be an entrepreneur, that that somehow cheapens their the purity of their art or something. And it's such, such a, an obvious falsehood because so many of the legends were actually super smart and very savvy in business. Yeah. You think of like... A lot of people don't want to. They don't have an interest or they don't have an inclination. Right. And, and back in the day, you, fine. there were some people who could get by without doing it. Sure. Uh, and good, you know, fine. But then it's it doesn't prepare you very much for anything going wrong you have to if you really if someone else is handling everything else you do you're going to be very lost when it comes time to put it all together i think right you know and and if you're somebody that doesn't have all those skills then you have to have somebody that you trust that does have those skills and yeah and that can be tough and a lot of artists get exploited for that reason um it's true but you know i i think what i remember what you did um and i thought as I was watching, like when we were on tour, we post modern jukebox, and I think it was the Europe tour, and you had, you were the last person out every night. Like we, we would go meet the fans out in the lobby, and it was fun, you know, and and everybody, you know, the cast had a good time in general, but but people were tired because we all did the show and everything like that. But you'd be yeah. the last person out there, and you had a whole stack of cards. You had all these <laughs> these like postcards, like they're probably worth money now. So if anybody's got those, you I've know. got boxes of them. Yeah. Who wants them? <laughs> They're worth money. I didn't say how much money, but they're worth money. It's um, a cent. I will give you guys, yeah. I'll pay you to come take these from my head. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but it had all your information and you went and you talked to everybody and it was didn't matter who they were. You spent the time to actually engage with all the fans and you made them, you know, they all felt like they knew you. And, you know, then I watched your numbers just explode online. I mean, I remember, I think when I met you, I don't know how many, you, on like Facebook, you know, um, arbitrary metric when we met i i maybe had a you know, like maybe a couple a thousand, thousand or so or something like yeah. but then fast forward to after this tour you were up to like over a hundred thousand you know yeah everybody was talking yeah. about you and it was really clear it was like whoa this is an artist that can make the jump and you know it's it's difficult it's difficult to make that jump into being a self-sustaining independent artist and it's it's a lot harder but than you know think. well thank you thank you i mean you taught me like how important um content and when you do how you make it and when you make it i mean you've you're you've been a master of that and when we first met my, my manager david wanted us to do a video and i was like oh what will that do and he was like just go meet with him he he gets it you don't get it yet just learn from him you know and and i learned so much and it it, it totally built my following in a major way and it's a it's a combination that i think that you've also seen of it's a combination of virality and content and also FaceTime and human interaction mm -hmm. and and connection it's so much about connection too you know and um, if you put all those together and it's it's the right combination mm -hmm. you can you can really make f fans that want to be a part of your life you know yeah and those are the ones that go with you from album to album that's the, what you want you don't want fans like a teenager where it's like they may be like one thing you do and then they're gone. Right. Well, you that's know? the, you know, that is the difference also about our fan base tends to be a little bit older, right? Than probably most yeah. artists, you know, most uh, pop artists anyway. 
um, you know, those those fans are the most fickle bunch. You know, the young fans that I mean, and you think about it. I mean, I remember being in yeah junior high or high school or something. You find a new band every week. You know, you don't yeah. you don't know uh-huh. enough music to like stick with one kind of. Th- you're like, oh, you know, I just heard the Red Hot Chili Peppers. This is my favorite band now. You know, like yeah. you have things like <laughs> that that happen, and. Um, But really the goal, the smart long-term play is to make these fans for life. And you do that, I think, I think that it's really authenticity. I think that it's, you know, not chasing trends because I think that um, chasing trends is probably the worst thing you want to do if you want to stand out and you want to get fans that stay with you on this journey. Yeah, absolutely. Agree. Totally. And you know, that what you were talking about with the cards and the signing and stuff, like I had never been on a tour, like when I went on your first that European tour we went on, yeah. I had never been on a tour like that with on a tour bus and the whole thing. Mm. And we did meet and greets before and, and we did meet and greets after and we did all sorts of stuff. And so that really taught me a lot about what people respond to and how to do it. Mm. And I mean, to this day, I do a pre-show and a post-show signing and meet and greet. And I wait till the very last person wants something signed because it's like, well, that person could, I don't want anybody to have a bad experience. I I want everybody to come back again. And, and I'm still at a building phase where I still really want people to, you know, to show up and bring their friends next time, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that that, you know, that phase never really ends, right? Like if you're a creative artist, if you're not like a legacy act that's touring on the basis of like a hit song from 20 years ago, you know, I mean, you're still, uh, and, and you have a lot of um, new stuff that you're always trying, which I think is really cool, too. Like, I, I mean, I saw you did uh, well, it was the Joni Mitchell album that you did. You did the whole. I did Joni Mitchell Blue. I've done a few full did, album covers. Was it the White Album, too? The White Album, yeah. You did the White Album. That's so crazy. How did you do Revolution yeah. Number 9? You'll have to listen. Okay, that was a good answer. <laughs> we did, yeah, we did. We did kind of what they did. We did kind of noise and, you know, not just, quite just as long. Just more, you number nine, number nine, number nine. Number nine, number nine. Yeah, we did the entire White Album. I did Jeff Buckley, Grace. The wow, whole album that's that. a beautiful album too. Yeah, I, I just kind of picked my favorite, some of my favorite albums and, and uh, try to get inside of them. When I'm in between things, I did Black Messiah. Yeah. I did, I did Continuum. John Mayer. Yeah. uh Um, So it's like one of my hobbies. That's so cool. That's so, I mean, and that's hard too, because I think that I know a lot of songs, but I don't think I know any like album through and through to the point that I remember every single song, you know? Well, I did a lot. I studied them again, you know, um, the why, you know, but I, it it just kind of gives me something to focus on getting like, okay, why it's one thing to like know a few songs. It's another thing to get inside of it. Why did they put it in this order? Mm. Why these keys? Why it's like, I love that. And it makes, gives me more, even more love and respect for the songwriting of those albums. Right. Cause it wasn't arbitrary. It was, they, you know, they cut a lot, like all these albums. I'm sure that, you know, they probably cut, what do you think? Like 20 songs or something like that. I think the White Album, they left everything on. It's 30 songs. Okay. It's a yeah. lot of songs. <laughs> All right, maybe that one. No editing on that maybe one. Maybe not that one. But other ones, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so now, yeah. um, I, and we should also talk about, I guess, probably your best known cover, right? Which actually is endorsed by Prince himself. Prince approved it. And yes, he's somebody Prince, that Prince when he was alive, approved. you know, he didn't approve anything, any covers of. Yes. So how did that come correct. about? Just tell that story. So, um, you know, Call My Name is the song. It's on a Prince album called Musicology. And uh, it's one of my favorite Prince songs. Mm. And it was actually the first song I ever arranged and sang with my first band, which I started a band when I was in Adam's Family. When I was in, that was my first Broadway show. So when I was in my first Broadway show, I started a band and we started playing gigs, really weird gigs. I didn't know what I was doing. It was a total potpourri. Um, and we would do gigs on, on days off. And I arranged this, started arranging covers. And so I arranged Call My Name with the horns and all that. And I would sing it and it was, people really loved it. Everybody would ask me to sing that song. So I sang it at every gig, every gig. And then when I got, years later, when I got signed, I re- recorded it, played it for the label. They loved it. But they said, we can't release this because it's Prince. Prince won't let us. And I was like, well, why doesn't somebody ask him? And they're like, nah, we can't deal with Prince's people. It's too much. It's too much. And I was like, okay. So I, we, rec- we released my whole album without Call My Name on it. Mm. And then, you know, I got transferred to the urban department at Epic and I was going to be played on, or we were hoping to get me on UAC, which is urban AC radio. And I played, so I went in for a meeting with the entire urban development team 
and on how to like kind of get me into like the black audience and you know um, more r&b audience and they i played them call my name they loved it and they were like we need to put this out immediately and i was like ask la you know he says we can't and so la comes in he's like yeah we can't deal with prince it's not gonna happen it's never gonna happen he's never gonna say yes i was like but why don't you just ask him so then time goes by time goes by and LA calls me one day and he says, you know, I had my music on shuffle and call my name came up. That's really good. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And he goes, we should call Prince. And I was like, yes, we should call Prince. <laughs> we should ask him. So he goes, okay, I'm going to call Prince. So he calls him and like five minutes later, Prince calls back and is like, I love this. Let's release it. Wow. So, so he gave me permission to release the song and do a video, which was very rare for him. Yeah, and, totally. Uh, it was, it was like, it was just felt like a total, total win. It was awesome. That's amazing. So we made a video and, and we it went to we took that song to radio like no joke a week later. Really? And we rebranded my whole album, added Call My Name, and we did a big video in LA and it was and it went to radio, it stayed at radio for it was the fastest moving song at you know, UAC and stayed at radio for many, many weeks. And it was, it was really to have that experience was really cool. Like the old school experience. Absolutely. Well, it was a beautiful performance. I mean, it was an amazing record. Thank you. But, um, Thank and you. you know, that's as soon as Prince passed, I don't know who's in charge of his estate, but I, I saw like clocks that had the Prince logo on it. I've seen so many licensing oh, things. He would hate all he of would this. Hate he would all hate all of this. it. And you know, I think he that, would never have said yes to any of this shit. No, totally. I think that people forget that he was very guarded of his, his work and he, yeah. He was very specific in how he, you know, so him allowing you to record that and release that. I mean, that's, that says a lot. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, and I, he tweeted and, and posted on, he put it on all his socials, like when the video came out and all that. And I, and I, in my mind, I was like, any day he's going to call me We're gonna go on tour and be, and be best friends. You know, it didn't, it didn't happen, but it's, uh, you know, an, a great part of, I love that part of my story. I think it's like a gift, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to get into a little yeah. bit about, you know, this weird time that we live in, which is the quarantine and the, yeah. you know, this global pandemic that, I don't mean, know, if anybody's listening in the future, uh, this is recorded in 2020, right at the height of <laughs> just the craziness. And, um, you know, I it's think it's, sink, it's sinking in now for everybody in the music industry, you know, of what this means. For, I mean, a concert industry, what is it? You know, it's based on getting people together. Um, so what's your plan personally? Like, how are you how are you dealing with all this? And and how are you approaching this as an artist? Well, you know, um, when the when the quarantine first happened and social distancing and all that and all the gigs got canceled, you know, every every single artist's tours and and symphony gigs and theater gigs, every single gig was was canceled, postponed. And initially I panicked. Um, I think it's kind of ingrained in an artist to kind of panic because that's our livelihood. Mm. And then I kind of gave over to, um, I accepted it pretty quickly. I'm thankfully quarantined with my husband, who's also my, you know, guitar player and my, my collaborator. Yeah. So I'm still able to make music and I'm very lucky. So it's not lost on me that I'm, that I am able to make music and express myself still and find ways of e-commerce because of the things I've done all these years, you know, between merch and online shows and writing and, and all the ways that I've had to learn how to make money in the past, in addition to, you know, Patreon and, and Facebook lives and stage it's and online right. shows and so many, thank God there's so many outlets now. You know, if this had happened a few years ago, I don't know what I would have done or know what any of us would have done. Sure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a I, very you know. different time now. Um, and I think it has taught a lot of musicians that, you know, all these things that you mentioned, you know, these live things and, uh, and Patreon and things like that. I mean, these are things that people can be doing just to supplement their income anyway. You know, these are things that yeah. musicians should be doing. I mean, I think that it's a smart, it's a smart approach to, you know, to diversify what you're doing. You know, you don't want to rely a hundred percent on touring. You don't want to rely a hundred percent on album sales. You know, you want to, you have, can't anymore. You, just you can't. know, it's I mean, safe. there was a time when you could, and you can't anymore. You can't rely on one, just one thing. Right. And it's, uh, I'm thankful that I had already been developing these things. Um, not to say that I, you know, I don't get nervous and, and want touring to return. Of course I do. But I also, as, and I'm sure you feel this way too, as a band leader, I have to be really careful with what, when am I going to feel okay yeah. 
saying to a band of people, okay, I'm going to be responsible for you. We're going to get on a bus again and, and go to a different city every single day. I have to right. be really, really sure that we're going to be safe because in addition to like standing in front, you know, meeting people every night and all the meet and greets that I do and all the, you know, that's still, I have to be, it has to be in a time when we can, when we're through this. And so I have to kind of develop some longevity for myself in my quarantine online persona yeah you have to yeah totally well i mean you you've been doing the right things i mean i i caught your stage at show you know uh or one of them yes, you do thank you, you do them a bunch in. right you you do weekly yeah we're shows doing or... we're doing shows uh once or twice a week throughout this time you know and if you want to tune in tune in and and i always do pay whatever you want and and I, th you know, if you, even if no one tunes in, I'm still going to be there playing music because I need it from for myself. Yeah. <laughs> well, I tuned in. There was a lot of people there. People were throwing down tips too because I, you know, I gave some money. It was awesome. But then it was like you're like number 17 in the rankings. So I'm like, whoa. I'm like, these are people that are they're throwing down. But it was great. I mean, it was awesome to hear you and Doug. Um, I mean, I was I said it there. You know, this is like some of the best music you're going to hear during the quarantine, like in a live setting. Well, thank like these you. are. You know, real musicians that are going live and playing great music, and well, I mean, thank it's you. it's yeah. The quarantine has been the great equalizer. You know, some of the bigger names that maybe depend a little bit more on production value. You know, they don't they don't have those things because they're they're at home. Yeah. You know. Well, yeah. I mean, it's like I, I we've also been releasing a, a a video every single day, so we've done forty six videos. <laughs> forty six videos. Every single. Yes, every single day we put it up on on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And I'm feeling it's so lazy right now. A quarantine theme, but we don't. You know, it's not like I. It's not. It's here. It's sitting here at the at our at our in our studio, and it's the two of us playing duo. You know, and I. It's just me. You know, I don't get all dolled up. It's just my face. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think it's really reminded me of like um, how important just real music is, yeah. and you're real the way the way you look and the way you sound and being your authentic self going back to authenticity and just um it's i've been so thankful that i'm still able to to do that yeah totally absolutely well i think that you know authentic was definitely the word to describe you you know you've always been yourself you've always um you've always had your own things that you've put out that represent you you know i never saw like a morgan yeah. thing is like well that's a weird choice you know like that's a weird choice for morgan yeah. like it's always like oh morgan would do that you know and, and even <laughs> even peggy you know like that's a morgan thing like you know i think people don't realize you have a good sense of humor you know i think that i yeah. mean people that know you do i think that maybe you don't take yourself so seriously you know you're I do not, you no. are not that person at all you know no i do not take myself seriously so i think that i take the music seriously but i don't take myself i think it's good to laugh at ourselves and i i think that the humbling things that have happened in my in my career like or in my past you know and i think if you've just like hauled bags of garbage and catered in new york <laughs> city for years on end i think you have to have a sense of humor no about totally yourself. yeah i mean Absolutely. You know, anybody that goes through those experiences and it's such a healthy, um, you know, humbling experience to have. And yeah, and it really absolutely. does keep you in touch. And I think as a result, you know, that comes through when people, when fans, uh, you know, hear you talk or they see you perform and everything like that. You're obviously somebody that's humble, that has this amazing talent that has worked really hard at, you know, you're you're one of the people, you know. Well, thank you. That means a lot. Thanks so much. Yeah. One of the people. That's my compliment for today. I'm one of the people. One of the people. Thank you. I, I just love being one of the people. All right. So I want to um, I want to wrap up this part. We're going to do a little part two yes. afterwards. We're going to get more more in depth. But um, but thank you so much for coming by and virtually. Yes. On Zoom. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, this was fun. And I, I hope that everybody at home, I hope, um, you know, everybody checks out all your work. Just you have such a wide variety of stuff from your broadway albums that you've done you know you've done what was it was it uh you just did jesus christ superstar with Shoshana and everybody oh right? i just released yeah an all-female uh selections from jesus christ superstar it's called she is risen wow okay and there I, you go i pr <laughs> i produced it i produced it and started it and raised the money and i i did everything <laughs> no kidding all right so you can yeah. check that out um of course your solo albums you know she has her own original music she's got her own covers you know uh, and then Peggy, if you just want to get weird with it. And then if you really just are so bored that you need something weird, there's Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Morgan. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, take care. <laughs>